What is Mashiach and what is Geula? A very important topic because it is one of the principles in Judaism that we look forward to Mashiach, that we are actually anticipating it. Even though he may tarry, he may delay, I will still look forward to him every day because he can come. And then we know he will come. He's coming. He's on his way, and it's very, very close. This is a very important topic, especially for our generation, because of the many events that are taking place right now, that everybody somehow is getting the feeling that something's about to happen. They just don't know exactly what it is, because they have maybe not learned about it. Maybe they don't really know what to expect. But the script has already been written. We have the script of what this world is going to go through approximately. The reason I say approximately is because even if you were to read all the prophets and know everything by heart, what the Kabbalah has to say about this topic, the Gemara and the Zohar, as the Rambam points out, we will never fully comprehend what the prophets exactly said. We will never have complete clarity until we get very, very close, up front, and are able to actually experience firsthand what is happening. Then we will be able to relate to the prophecies that were spoken in the past, and we will be able to confirm, yes, this is actually happening right now. This is a, an exciting topic, only because of what is going to happen. And even though, it, when I say exciting, it, I'm talking about something very special and good, not all of it is so easy. Not all of it is, a, is so smooth. It's not a very smooth ride. Nevertheless, all is well that ends well. When we're talking about Mashiach and the Geulah, we're talking about the very, very end of it, even though in reality it will occur in stages and it is quite a lengthy process until it is all complete. What's interesting about this process and about this major event in the history of mankind is that it, it's not only the Jews who are looking forward to it or anticipating it, even the Goim, the non-Jewish world, the Christians and the Muslims especially, they know something about it. They may not have all the details. They don't exactly have this tradition that we have. They don't even know what Geula really means. And that's what I want to discuss tonight, a little bit about what is going to happen too, but also to explain what's the importance of this process. Why does it actually have to happen? What's involved? When we talk about Geula, the world itself, the world, the word Geula, redemption, means what? Simplistically, basically, Geula means to redeem, to become a free man once again. Because after all, being in the Galut, being in the diaspora, means that we're not completely free. We're at the mercy of the Gentiles, at the mercy of the nations, so Geulah number one will therefore mean we're going to be set free, not being in any sort of bondage anymore. We will also be going home. That's another part of the, the Geulah process, going back home. And we will not have any burdens, burdens like taxation and the like. We will be completely set free. There are many Gemarot that bring down what Shemuel describes as his version of Yemot HaMashiach, the days of Mashiach. Shemuel says, when Mashiach will come, things will not be very different. He says, According to him, the only big difference between the world as we know today and when Mashiach arrives is that we will not have the She'ibud, the burden of the nations. We will be free, we will be independent, we will be on our own, we will be back home. He describes it very simplistic. And he says that the big prophecies that are talking about a very beautiful time, a paradise on earth, seems to be more talking about later on sometime, perhaps even Olamaba. It is not clear in the Gemara why his opinion is as such, except for that he brings proof from a verse that says there will always be poor people on earth. In other words, even after Mashiach arrives, 
The other opinion, however, says that there will be major changes. And as Tosafot brings out, what do you mean no changes besides no burden, no bondage? What about Binyan Bet HaMikdash? What about the rebuilding of Yerushalayim? What about all these things? What about the Chiyat HaMetim? So, in the process of giving you an explanation of what is going to happen, I will hopefully reconcile the two and show to you that there really is no dispute about what is going to happen in, during Mashiach's times. Because it all depends at what stage we're talking about. The big difference, however, between this upcoming Geula and any other Geula that we've had before, we've had Geula, we had a Geula from Israel, from Egypt, we had a Geula from Bavel, we came back to Eretz Israel. This Geula is special, that it's not just becoming free from some sort of servitude, from taxation, from burdens, there's something else happening and that will happen very soon in this Geula that makes it unique. This Geula redeems not only Am Yisrael, it redeems the world. And it redeems the world from the Koach Ara, from that which is evil. There are evil forces out there. And we spoke about it in the past, what the purpose of, of this creation, what do we need evil in this world. That's another topic. But when Mashiach comes, when the Geula arrives, it is a Geula for the entire world to redeem it from that force, from, any, from all sources of evil, from all sources of impurity. And once you eliminate that, not only do you become free from the, sh from the shackles of evil, you also will become sh free from the Yetzer Ara. So when we're talking about Herut, when we're talking about freedom now, with this Geula, upcoming Geula, it means that at some point there will no longer be any Yetzer Ara, any evil inclination. And at some point, a little bit later on, there will no longer be Malach HaMavet, the angel of death. So now we begin to appreciate what we're actually looking forward to. This is a time where the world is actually going back to its original blueprint. So Geula is a form of tikkun for the world, a refua, a remedy of what the world looks like today in, a, in some sort of chaos, not, in, not as it, it should be, not as it was originally planned. It is going back to the original blueprint before Chet Adam Arishon, before the first sin. It's going back to what it should be like, where everybody is doing the will of Hashem, of God. So Geula, therefore, now begins to take form and shape as a big event, as a major event, that is very, very different than anything that we've ever known till now. Because even though Shemuel just told us that there's not a big deal, no big difference, except that we will be going, go, going back home, being free. At some point, at least, we will have, and he admits, that we will have changes occur, including the elimination of death, no malach amavet. As the pasuk clearly says, bila amavet la netzach, which we say to mourners that at some point, we're looking forward, that death will cease to exist. And Hashem will wipe the tears of all the mourners. We're looking forward to that. It is very painful to hear about a death, especially someone that was close to us. Well, that will cease to exist. So that's something very, very special. So the upcoming Geula, therefore, is not just becoming free, as we know freedom to be, independence. It's more than that. It's freedom of the angel of death. It's freedom of the Yetzer Ara. It's it's freedom of all the forces of evil that exist in this world, which is the source of all wars and all problems. There is another event that we will be talking about separately right after Purim, and that is Mechiyat Amalek, which will also be associated with the final war of all wars, the biggest war of all, the final war, Gog and Magog. That's a separate lecture, but that's also on the heels of Mashiach. It is also an event that will take place during this time, but we need to talk about that separately, but because when we talk about eradicating all evil, eliminating it forever, what we're really talking about is Amalek as well. We're talking about the forces of evil, forces of impurity, 
and that is that needs to be discussed separately how does that come about why wasn't it done till now why does Hashem eventually going to do it why couldn't we have done it I mean even though we were supposed to do uh, our best in eradicating evil in the end Hashem is going to do it why does he leave it towards the very very end so that's a question in itself Okay, so now that we understand that Geula is something for the entire world, does it have any bearing on Am Yisrael? In other words, is there any significance, any importance for us besides the world? Of course. For the Jewish nation, this process also is the beginning of the process called Olam HaNetzach, Olam HaSchar, Olam Haba. The world to come. Before we enter the world to come, which is the world where one is rewarded for all the hard work and, and all his efforts that he has made to observe the rules of Hashem, a spiritual world, before we come to that point, there will be several events that will take place that will prepare us to enter that world. This, of course, even though it, it affects even the righteous amongst the nations, even the righteous amongst the nations have a share to the world to come. Nevertheless, for the most part, when we talk about Olam Abba, we're talking about Am Yisrael, as it says, Kol Yisrael yesh lem helek l'olam Abba. That is the time that we're looking for because of all our hard work, all the sacrifices that we've made, all that we've had to endure and experience in the long galut. Now is payday. So for Am Yisrael, this topic of Mashiach, Geula, involves as well the Olam Abba, because that is what follows after Mashiach has come. So it's not so much that we're just waiting for Mashiach himself, for the Geula, just to go back to Israel. You can go back now too if you want. Right? It, it symbolizes a period of time that will prepare us for the Olam HaNetzach, Olam HaSechar, the world of reward. That is, after all, what we've been working so hard for. That's Geula. That's briefly what the redemption represents. What about Mashiach himself? The individual called Mashiach, what is he all about? What is his role in all of this? Mashiach represents kingdom. He's the king. Malchut Israel is restored. The reign of Mashiach will represent a period of time where Am Yisrael will once again have a king as it had in the past. And that Malchut of Mashiach will be different than any Malchut of past kings because this Malchut of Mashiach is also to prepare us shakai, to prepare the world with the kingdom with, of Hashem. So Mashiach, even though he becomes our king, even though he rebuilds the Bet HaMikdash, he also prepares the world for Malchut Hashem. As we all say, Vaya Hashem al kol aretz, Vayom ahu yeh Hashem echad ushmo echad. Right? And that day, Hashem will be one. He will be recognized by everyone as one. There will only be one truth, one religion, one form of worship, one language. In a sense, everybody will be united with the same idea. There will be clarity. There won't be the Yetzirah as I mentioned earlier. So that's Mashiach's role and I'm going to explain what I mean by Mashiach. After all, which Mashiach are we talking about? There's two. Mashiach ben Yosef, Mashiach ben David. We're going to get to that. But in general, Mashiach, when we talk about Mashiach, we're talking about the man, the individual, who will be a king for some number of years, and he will prepare the way for Malchut Hashem in this world. Besides the building of the Bet HaMikdash, besides whatever else that he will do, that is his job as a king. Now, when he comes, he will have to prove that it's him. How will we know that it's him? Traditionally, we know what he has to do. So there is a list out there of what Mashiach has to accomplish in order to prove that it's him, that he has arrived. After all, you know what the Christians claim, that he already came. But the problem is that he, if he came, then we don't have everything that we're supposed to have. We don't have a Bet HaMikdash. We don't have peace on earth. Am Yisrael is still scattered, even though some of us already are there. A lot of the things that Mashiach is supposed to accomplish have not been done. So they finally came up with an explanation for that. 
There's going to be a second coming. He failed the first time, so he gets a second chance to try again the second time. But we don't have it anywhere in the sources that says that he's going to fail the first time, he's going to come a second time. He's going to come once, and he's going to succeed. His mission is very, very clear. And you know what? It's so clear that when he comes, we will have no doubts that he's here. If anybody has any doubts, then it's not him. It will be so clear by what he does, by what he accomplishes, that everybody will know Mashiach has come. He has not come. There have been attempts by several individuals, not just one, to claim that they were Mashiach, and they turned out to be all false prophets, false messiahs. And the Torah warns us about this phenomena, that there can be and will be, unfortunately, individuals who will claim, make all sorts of claims that God spoke to them, God has sent them, whether it's a prophet or a messiah or whatever. There will be all, all these kind of individuals for some personal agenda that they have that they want to make this claim. But in the end, the Torah tells us one of the ways you will know that they failed is that they will die. They will be put to death. They will not succeed. And of, of course, we could test them too. And if they were put to the test, they would fail the test. They have to accomplish certain things. Not anybody can be Mashiach. And as I've explained in the past in another lecture, in every generation which may have a propitious time for the, for the Geulah to occur, for the redemption to, be, to occur, there is an individual in that generation who has the Neshama of Mashiach, and if the time is right and we are worthy of it, he will reveal himself. He does not know himself that he's the Mashiach until he is let known from above. So right now, amongst us somewhere, probably he's already in Israel, there is an individual who probably already knows that he's the Mashiach, just waiting for the go-ahead to reveal himself. And hopefully this should happen very, very soon. But as I, as I explained before, in every generation there exists that possibility, at least in the past few generations where Mashiach can come, he could have come already. And if he doesn't, that individual passes away, and the next time around a new individual is born with that neshama, with that soul, to be the Mashiach. So this era called Yemota Mashiach is really divided into various stages, various parts. It will last a number of years. And that is why I explained there's no machloket, there's no dispute between what Shemuel says and what the other rabbis say about what will actually occur during this era, Yemota Mashiach. Because it's going to be in stages. And at one stage, Shemuel is right. What will be noticeable is that Amisa will not be amongst the Gentiles dispersed in the Galut and the Diaspora. They will be back home. They will be on their own, independent. They will have their Malchut, their kingdom restored. So that will be evident, but that's just one part of Yemot Mashiach. Does anybody here know how long Yemot Mashiach will be? Well, it depends on which Gemara you look at. There is one Gemara that actually divides the 6,000 years that this world will exist into three parts. The last 2,000 years is Yemot Mashiach. What that means, the last 2,000 years is Yemot Mashiach. it means that any time during those last 2,000 years, Mashiach can come. It doesn't actually mean that the experience that we will have during these last 2,000 years will be the same. And the last 1,000, 1,500 years was very, very, had its ups, ups and downs. I mean, we had expulsions, we had crusades, we had a lot of trouble. We had the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash, the second one. So there's a lot of things that have happened, but Mashiach can potentially come during the last 2,000 years of this world as we know it, the physical world called Olam Azeh. But the actual Yemot Mashiach, where well, many, many events will occur that are so different than anything we know in the past, is 365 years. Okay, anybody know his math here? How many years is it to the year 6,000? In other words, what year would it be if it's 6,000 minus 365? Which year would it be if Yemot HaMashiach is 365 years and it ends by the year 6,000? On the non-Jewish calendar, what year would that be? 
we have 231 years now left to go to the year 6000. And I said 365. It would be the year 1875. Right? The year 1875, from the year 1875, which corresponds to the Jewish year 5,635, you will have 365 years left to the year 6,000. Everybody follow me? The year 1875 corresponds to the Jewish year 5,635. So from 5,635, how many years do we have left? 365. 365 years, the rabbis tell us, keneged, corresponding to the days of the solar year. And there's a reason, according to the Kabbalah, on why it needs to be 365. These are the last. Mashiach could have come before then, but these are the last years that are really going to be eventful. Eventful, Yemot Mashiach. The Zora says there's going to be a major event a little bit before that, 35 years beforehand, in the year 1840, 5760 from creation, where the gates of wisdom will open up. And ever since the year 1840, gates of wisdom opening up, there have been major discoveries, inventions. One after another, once electricity came, everything opened up. I mean, the list is so long. I mean, we can be here for hours just talking about the major discoveries that have occurred ever since. Up until that year, 1840, the world was pretty much the same. What did they invent until the year 1840? Yeah, you had the binoculars, the telescope, you had the printing press, yeah, you had glasses, I think, which is basically the same thing, lenses, right? You have some better tools. The world didn't really change that much. I'm not talking about the dress code. I'm talking about major changes People still went to the restroom in the same way in the year 1805 than they did in the year 1505, right? I mean, life was primitive compared to today. Today, last year was primitive to today. Today, everything is changing so fast, right? That if you had a computer six months ago, Isaac, it's useless, right? Everything has changed so much. Everything is changing. The, at such a fast pace, as though the world is getting ready for something. These are Yemota Mashiach, Yemota Mashiach in one form, where many major events are occurring to prepare the world for something. All of a sudden, all of these inventions are coming in, whether it's in the medical field, whether it's in technology, aviation, cars, I mean, just incredible things, cell phones. You know, you can talk to someone on the other side of the globe by just holding a piece of metal, flat. And if you're more sophisticated, you could even see his picture on that piece of flat metal that has a bunch of buttons on it. I mean, if you would tell this to somebody, to your grandfather when he was a child, 75 years ago, he'd think you're crazy. That one day we're going to get to the moon, walk on the moon? I mean... Right? So today we take things for granted. You fly from here to Israel, 15 hours nonstop. 15 hours. Do you know how long it took for people to go to Israel from Warsaw, from Russia, from the Ukraine, 200 years ago during the time of the Baal Shem Tov, 250 years ago? Weeks, months, if they ever made it. <laughs> Incredible. 15 hours you get up on a plane, an entire village of three, 400 people, you cross over all the oceans, and you land just like a bird. I mean, we, we're just so used to it. But it's a great miracle. Well, how do you think all the Jews are going to come to Israel soon? al can finish Sharim on the wings of eagle. And that is why the Israeli government thought of making a new airport to accommodate all this mass aliyah that Bezat Hashem will come soon. After all, the infrastructure has to be in place, some infrastructure. So all the, all the malaria... Uh, swamps had to be dried out, all the roads had to be laid, right, because people are moving there. So that has happened over the past 61 years, little by little, to prepare the land, to prepare the world for the coming of Mashiach. 
even though the technology of Mashiach, of course, his days will be very different even than today, nevertheless, the world is getting ready for that. The world is changing, changing drastically in a way that was never known before. So these 365 years, or if you count from the year 1840, 395 years or so, or actually a little, a little bit more, yeah, the 400 years total, will be Yemot HaMashiach that will be eventful. These are eventful years of major discoveries, major things that were never known before. The Chochmah existed, but it was not available. As the Zohar says, the gates of wisdom will open up. All of a sudden, we will realize, how come we didn't think of that before? I mean, people are not necessarily smarter today than they were back then. There were some very, very smart people during the time of the Egyptian civilization that made all the big pyramids. The Incas were very, very smart and very advanced in their way. I mean, if they had the, the education, if they just had the direction, they could have done these things too, maybe even better than the way they do it today. So something is happening, and all of this is part of Yemot Mashiach. However, all of this has to happen in stages, because the Kabbalah says that all of these Chochmah, especially the Chochmah of Yemot Mashiach, the great wisdom, is compared to a tremendous big light. And just like you can't go from darkness to light quickly, we have to go slowly. So all this tremendous amount of light that we are about to receive, about to absorb, has to come little by little. As I've explained in the past, it is not a coincidence that ever since the destruction of the Second Temple, the majority of the world, except for the Chinese and the Indians, and actually they're the majority, but a great part of the world's population is no longer pagan. We have Christianity and Islam religions that in the past these people were pagan, becoming not exactly monotheistic, except for Islam. They believe in some modification of that monotheism. But nevertheless, it's the belief in more or less in one God and not in many gods. All of a sudden we have these two big religions, Christianity and Islam, believing in one God, exactly what the Jews believe in. They also believe in preparing themselves for this big redemption, all because of Jewish influence, and all because Hashem is preparing the world for the belief in one God. So we see on various fronts preparation for Mashiach, preparation for something big, something very, very different. And you hear it in the news too, you hear the words, a new world order. They're talking about a new world order, they don't even know what they're talking about. And if you ask a European, where is the new world order, he'll tell, what do you mean? We already have it, it's the euro. One currency. And the latest thing is that America may join too. You may have one currency all over the world. I wouldn't be surprised if that happens. One currency all over the world. So something is changing. Something is about to happen, and not everybody knows exactly what it is, but we know that it's all in preparation for Mashiach. So this is a very, very big light, and because this is a very big light that's coming in our direction, it's going to be gradual. It's going to be in stages. And therefore, at some stage, even Shemuel will agree with the other opinion that there will be many, many things that were very, very different than what we know today. It depends on what stage of Mashiach we're talking about. At one point, yes, independence, going back home. And for Amisal, this going back home is very, very special because it also symbolizes if a husband and wife returning after many years of being separated or divorced. It's a very special reunion. It's a reunion with Hashem. And it's a strengthening of that bond with Hashem. So all around, this is a, is a very important stage for us, for Am Yisrael. And because of the immensity of the light, of the reward, of all that we're going to be witnessing very, very soon, Hashem brings it in stages. He makes it happen slowly. Now perhaps you can understand the meaning of one of the verses, a famous verse in the prophet, describing the coming of the Mashiach as Ke'anisha Rochev al Hamor, like a poor man riding on a donkey. You know that a couple years ago people didn't understand it, and I think now they will. And I, even though I mentioned it a little bit years ago, 
I will give it more emphasis now and you will all agree that it fits perfectly with our generation, with our time. It used to be that this pasuk, Ani Sherochev al Chamor, some people actually take it literally. Mashiach, they're expecting to see a guy riding on a donkey in the street. You know, I'm Mashiach. A lot of what the prophets say is allegoric. It doesn't, he could be riding a Lexus. I don't think so, but anyway. He can, be, he, can, he can come any way he wants. He doesn't have to come on a donkey. So what does it really mean? Ani, as a poor man. A poor man? Does that ring a bell? Is anybody poor these days? <laughs> there will be a tremendous amount of poverty right before Mashiach comes. See, years ago, they did not associate the poor man riding on a donkey as poverty. What did they say it meant? It meant that Amisa will be like a poor man, poor in tradition, distant from Hashem. Ani. Rochev al Hamor, riding on a donkey because the process is slow, a donkey travels slowly. But Hamor, the commentaries explain, also is the root of the word materialism. It will be a very materialistic society. And now you can fit the poor with the materialism. The poverty will come on the heels of materialism. Which means what? That right before the poverty hits people, they will be on a very high standard of living. As the Midrash says, Shamanta avita kasita elu Mashiach. Three generations before Mashiach's arrival, not the entire 365 years, but three generations, which is approximately between 20 to 25 years per generation, you're going to have the high standard of living that you've never had in the entire history of mankind. Ever since world, the end of World War II, we have had a rise in the standard of living. And I explained this in the past too, that this may have something to do with allowing Amisa to do a tremendous amount of chesed and kindness with each other, to bring about Ahavat Chinam, to love each Jew, to help him. It has to do with being able to rebuild Israel, the infrastructure. We need money. Where is the money going to come from? From America, from all over the world. So the high standard of living is for a reason too. It does a lot of good, but unfortunately it does have negative consequences. As a result of the high standard of living, a lot of Jews, a lot of people, have abandoned religion and instead have began to worship the golden calf, the money. On the heels of that comes poverty. Why? Why poverty? Well, first of all, in order for the poor man to really feel the pain of poverty, he will have had to have been rich before. Historically, many, many Jews, if not most Jews, were not even middle class. They were struggling. Jews struggled. Life was tough. It still is, but in a different way. Life was very, very tough. And today, you know, at least not, not too long ago, people were enjoying themselves pretty much. Unless, of course, you were living somewhere in, uh, in Zanzibar or in some poor country, you know. Uh, most of the world is, is doing pretty well, was doing well. So the poverty, in order for it to be felt, in order to be, for it to be painful, it had to have been after somebody was very, very wealthy or doing very well, very comfortable. Then, all of a sudden, you take his money away and he still has the same expenses. He still has his mortgage. He still has the car lease. He still has all the credit card payments. He still has the same lifestyle you know how painful that is if you cannot be you're not able to keep that same lifestyle with less money so therefore this poverty will be felt will be much more painful after all of that is taken away had we not had all that standard of living the high standard of living we would not have felt the pain as much people were always poor what's the big deal now it will be a big deal they will feel it more but the question still is, why does Hashem bring poverty in the end of days? Why poverty? Rabbis tell us a poor man is like a dead man. There are several individuals that are considered as though they would be dead. One who's blind, one who has no children because he has no continuation, one who's poor. Poverty is replacing death. According to the Kabbalah, if somebody was a, supposed to die because of some decree, Hashem can replace that decree of death with poverty. 
He loses his job, loses money. He feels terrible. How did I trust the guy? How did I give him my money? It's all in Hashemayim. Everything is in Hashemayim. I mean, people have, obviously have to be careful how they invest their money, not to be foolish. You know, as they say in English, if it sounds too good, it is. You know something is wrong with it. And people are complaining about all this money that they lost to certain individuals. They were getting interest that didn't make too much sense. How long will it last? Eventually it will fail. But people don't learn from history. History repeats itself. The fools come back. The suckers come back. And the con artists are always there. We always have the same people. The names have been changed. That's all. But anyway, right before Mashiach comes, this does happen because it's an alternative to death. Hashem does not want to bring death. Hashem doesn't want people to die. There's no more time, according to the Kabbalah, for reincarnations. Reincarnation is a form of tikkunim. The time we're running out of time. So there's no more time for gilgulim, for reincarnation. So tikkunim, tikkunim are ways to repair, to do some sort of repair for the soul and atonement, has to come about in all sorts of other ways. One way is poverty. So poverty will be something that the rabbis emphasize very clearly, will affect all the world right before Mashiach will come. As the rabbi tells in the Gemara, minakis, until people will be penniless. They're, they're, you know, you heard about the big bailout now. That means they're going to print more money. And what happens when they print all these tons of money? The inflation. So the dollar, some are saying, will not even be worth like tissue paper. I mean, we're worthless. Who knows? I mean, that's, that's a possibility. Right? We, don't, we can't predict the future accurately. But we do know that there will be economic hardships, at least. And all, that, all those hardships are intended to bring about teshuvah, to bring about a repentance, to bring about a, a, the closeness that Hashem is, is wanting for us to be with Him. Closer, not distant. And what caused that distance? The golden calf, the money in this generation. Well, I'll take that away from you because I want to humble your heart. I want you to become closer to me. I don't want you to be so materialistic. So all of this is also, besides being an atonement, is also a form of preparing the world, preparing Am Yisrael to get closer to him, to realize that all of these vanities are useless. We're not here for that. We're not here to make money. We're here to serve Hashem. But people forget that message, forget their mission. They get distracted, carried away by all of these vanities that the Goyim are selling. And we get caught in all this hype, as they call it. But soon, there's not going to be any hype. Not all of this is going to disappear. And that's going to force people to reevaluate their priorities, to reevaluate what is truly important in life. Rabbis tell us that towards the end, right before Mashiach comes, the greatest nisayon, the greatest test that the Jews will have is Ubechol Meodecha. As we say in the Kriyat Shema, to love Hashem Bechol Levavecha, Bechol Nafshecha, Bechol Meodecha, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your money. In the past, we've demonstrated the love with all our heart. The service of Hashem years ago was very, very strong. Tremendous devotion, tremendous self sacrifice by our forefathers. Jews were willing to give their life for what they believed in. Those tests are behind us. They occurred during times when the Goyim forced us to either bow to the cross, Chaz Shalom, or to some other idol, or, or whatever, or, or give up our life, or be burnt at the stake. Jews were already tested in their faith, in their allegiance to Hashem, by either giving their life or doing it with all their heart. The last generation will be tested Bechol Meodecha with all their money, with all their possessions. Will they stay steadfast in their emunah, in their faith? What will happen? How will they deal with this? What will their attitude be? How will they react to all of this? Are they going to be humbler and do teshuvah and repent? Or are they going to just continue in their ways? So this will be a test. This will be a time that a Jew will be tested to see 
how he reacts to all of this. So those who are aware, those who know that this is what's happening, this is, is meant to be, it will be easier for them. Somebody that did not expect all of this to happen, he's in a big shock. But you know what? What's strange is that even in this big shock, some people are in denial. You ask somebody about, somebody from the street, oh, what do you think about the market? Ah, oh, it's cycles in the economy. You know, this new president, he's going to get us out of it, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, I wish he was right, but I, I'm, I'm usually a, an optimist, but not this time. Uh, even some of the big experts are saying that it's only going to get worse. So that's, uh, it's, it's hard to, to accept that because we really, really would want things to get better. We do. You know, Bezat Hashem. You know, there are many prophecies that say that Bezat Hashem, we will be taking a lot of our riches with us to Israel. It all depends when you leave. <laughs> yeah, if you live now, maybe. But if you wait a little bit longer, there may not be anything left. Anyway, let's talk a little bit now about this process. Now that I've given you more or less of an introduction, a little bit of an understanding of what it means, what Geula is, what Mashiach is, what is, what is exactly going to happen during the last stages of, of uh, Yemota Mashiach, what should we be expecting? This process called uh, Geula or Yemota Mashiach is really divided into several parts, three main parts. Part number one that we're very familiar with is Kibbutz Galuyot, the ingathering of the diaspora. The second one is the building of Yerushalayim. And when we say the building of Yerushalayim, we're not talking about the, very, the many neighborhoods, the beautiful neighborhoods that they're building. Anytime you see Bone Yerushalayim, we're talking about Bet HaMikdash. So even though Yerushalayim is being built up, it's not built up if there's no Bet HaMikdash. So therefore the Pasuk says like this, Bone Yerushalayim Hashem, Mekabetz Nidchei Yisrael, or Nidchei Yisrael Yechanes actually, the stages will be, depending if you, if you follow the Zohar or the Gemara, there will be an ingathering of the diaspora, the building of the Bet HaMikdash, and then Tchiyat HaMetim. He will heal us, heal our hearts, heal our pain. That's the stage of Tchiyat HaMetim, the, the stage of the resurrection when the dead will rise. So there will be an ingathering of the diaspora before the Bet HaMikdash is built. There will be an ingathering of the diaspora afterwards because the ingathering of the Kibbutz Galuyot happens also in stages. But all of that has to happen to a great extent before Tchiyat HaMetim. As we've mentioned in the past, Tchiyat HaMetim, according to one source, is 40 years after, afterwards, after the Bet HaMikdash, or after this process of Kibbutz Galuyot is complete. Only then does Triyat HaMetim occur. But since Triyat HaMetim also occurs in stages, not everybody gets up at once, people will be getting up, you know, little by little over the 40-year period. Who gets up early? Whoever has the merit, whoever has the merit to be around the time of Mashiach. Because if you get up early, you will be able to have all these experiences, the beautiful experiences of Yomot HaMashiach. If you get up at the end, you've missed out. And there is a great merit to those who are buried in Israel because those who are buried in Israel will get up first before those who are buried outside of Israel unless they were righteous. Those who were righteous outside of Israel will also uh, move to Israel and get up in Israel before the rest of them. So depending on, on one's merits, that, is, that will determine when he or she gets up. During this uh, process, Triyat HaMetim is, is a stage, as I said in the very, very beginning, which basically means that all of evil is gone, disappeared. There's no more impurities in the land. There's no more Yetzirah, no more Mulach HaMavet. And Triyat HaMetim therefore symbolizes one of the greatest Tikkunim of all, one of the greatest repairing of all. Because when, when did the first incident occur? where there was something wrong taking place in the beginning of creation, when Adam and Chava went against the instruction of Hashem. And what did that do? 
that caused death to come to the world. Right? That is what it says, that you will not live forever. So therefore, Tchiyat HaMetim in itself is a very important stage in undoing or making a tikkun for that particular incident that brought death into the world. So Tchiyat HaMetim is a little bit later on in this process of, of Mashiach, but a very, very important part of the tikkun, of the, of the completion of the geulah, the process of the redemption. As all of this is happening, there will be a great bilbul, a great confusion. The confusion will be like this. Okay, Mashiach is coming, but on the one hand we see miracles, on the other hand we see war and suffering. I mean, the Holocaust, World War I and World War II is also part of this process. Just that we, we are beyond that. Many of us are, are too young to remember it. But if you read the history, if you were able to live then and now, you would say, oh, those were terrible days. Scary times. They were. So you're asking yourself, wow, it's very confusing. Here we have miracles. The Jewish people going back to the land. The land is prospering, flowering, blossoming. Beautiful. Miracles of the Six-Day War, miracles now in Israel. Miracles, a lot of good things happening. On the other hand, there's a lot of, still a lot of darkness, intermarriage, assimilation, just all, all these terrible things happening. So this causes confusion. And that's why some people are saying, oh, who says Mashiach is coming? They're confused by this, what appears to be a contradiction. But it's not a contradiction. The good things are indicators that Hashem has mercy on us. The difficult things are His calling out to us to do Teshuvah. So it's like a father who slaps you on the, with one hand, but then embraces you and kisses you and hugs you and calls you, to, please come, come back. So the two are being employed. Why do we have to have all these terrible things happen now? According to the Kabbalah, any time something good is about to happen, right before that something good occurs, the attribute of justice begins to accuse. Why? Why do they deserve this? Why are you going to give this to them? Just like it happened to us when we were leaving Egypt. The attribute of justice was accusing us. Why perform all these miracles for them? They were just as idol worshippers as the Egyptians were. So Midat din right now, the attribute of justice, is accusing there are debts to pay, debts that have accumulated over years, if not centuries. Debts are the sins that were never atoned for. And there's no more time to atone for them. And I want to be fair, of course. These are not just debts that the Jews owe. There are debts that the non-Jews owe. Lots of them, more than us. So during this process of incredible miracles that are going to happen slowly but surely, where all the prophecies are going to be fulfilled, there's going to be some painful moments, and the painful moments are to collect the debts. As they say, the Chafet, I think it was the Chafetz Chaim who said that this is a time when the owner of the shop closes his shop. He therefore has to collect all the debts that are due to him. No more credit. Closing up the shop. The Galut is being closed up. So Hashem is collecting all the debts. And that is worth the pain is all about for the Jews. And for the Goyim, for the Goyim it's called Nekama. It will be called revenge. It's also Midat Adin, exacting revenge for all the terrible things that they've done to us in the past. Therefore the Zohar says something incredible. In order to bring about correct justice and revenge to all the troublemakers, all those kings who have long died are going to be reincarnated. They're going to come back including Titus, Nebuchadnezzar, Sancherev, all of them, all the ones that caused us trouble. And you never know who Clinton is. Bill Clinton? Jimmy Carter? Could you wonder, could you figure that one out? I mean, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they may be somebody who was reincarnated from a past life, 1,500 years ago. And who would be the reincarnation of Isabella from Spain? How about Hillary? Does, uh, does it fit her? Yeah. I'm not sure. <laughs> you never know. All of these people that lived in the past will come back reincarnated, as Zohar says. 
And the Al-Shikha Kadosh explains, why do they have to come back? Because when they lived their life and did what they did, they died a peaceful life. Unless they were overthrown and killed or assassinated. Right? They died peacefully. Where's all the revenge? Yes, the empire fell apart. Okay, but what about the troublemaker himself? Before the empire fell apart, he died. At the age of 65, 75, 85. What about him? Genom is not enough. Eventually, we have to see the revenge with our own eyes. Therefore, they come back. So there will be a time of Pur'aniyot, of major events in the world, not just wars. It will come in the form of all kinds of natural phenomena, earthquakes and tsunamis, all kinds of problems, disease, of plagues, that will bring about the collapse of certain countries, of certain peoples, that Hashem has a long cheshbon, a long reckoning and accounting with them. It's payday. Payday for the reward and payday for what's coming to those who are evil. Because evil is disappearing. And evil will also take with it all those evildoers. Besides all this natural phenomena, the Zohar says you will have itutim, otot bashamayim. You will have signs in the heavens. There will be astronomical phenomena that we're yet to see. We have not seen it yet. Even though those of you who remember the Schumacher Levy comets, 21 of them striking the planet Jupiter, that was a major event in the history of astronomy. N nothing like that has ever been recorded before. Even though it was only observable through powerful telescopes, nevertheless, it was a major event. What does that mean? We will know soon. But it definitely meant something. Hashem, Hashem just, does not just throw comets at planets. 21 of them, think a little bit about it, what it means. That's nothing compared to the major phenomena, astronomical phenomena that we will see very, very soon. And what is that for? That is the alarm. That is this final signal that Mashiach is coming. In other words, we will know in various ways that Mashiach is coming. Besides all the major events in the world, people will still say, oh, that's natural. Oh, there is a fault, the San Andreas fault. That's why there was an earthquake. There has to be something that will remove any doubts. So there will be some major things that will happen in the world that will remove any doubt that something great is happening. It's not an economic cycle. It's not just a tsunami. It must be something, something very, very different. And that's what we're going to be soon seeing. Mashiach, what is he going to do in all this? Well, let's talk a little bit about Mashiach ben David and ben Yosef and Eliyahu Navi. The three main players in this process. Mashiach ben Yosef really represents the ten tribes, which we'll be talking about in two weeks. The ten lost tribes. Yosef is from the ten tribes. Ephraim, Menashe, half of Menashe. Mashiach ben David really represents Yehuda and Binyamin, which most of the Jews are from today, besides those who are Kohanim and Levim. That's on a simplistic level. Each of the two have roles. Even though the Kabbalah says that it's one individual whose father is from one tribe and whose mother is from a different tribe, that's a possibility too. And even though there's another opinion that holds that we're not even talking about two individuals, we're talking about two periods in time. A period in time called Mashiach ben Yosef and a period of time where there will be a Mashiach ben David. When we talk about Mashiach, by the way, we're talking about Mashiach ben David. But traditionally, we do have a tradition that there will be two individuals. The first one to appear at the scene will be Mashiach ben Yosef. And his job is to begin in earnest the process of kibbutz galuyot, to bring everybody home. He will fight the many wars and battles with Edom, all those who belong to Edom, Europe, America. And he will be in charge of removing all the impurities, at least from the land of Israel. Any impurities, there are some impurities still there. That's his job for the most part. He may be a president, he may be a prime minister, he may be a very strong leader. And his government or his leadership will only last for a little while. What happens after that is a new man, a new individual comes, and he's the one that finishes the job by removing Ishmael or fighting Ishmael 
removing or destroying the klipa of Amalek, which we'll talk about separately, and building the Bet HaMikdash. So if you want to divide up the roles between these two, that's more or less how we divide them up. Minyan Bet HaMikdash is, of course, one of the last things that will happen, and that occurs with Moshe Ben David. What about Eliyahu and Avi? Anybody know here what Eliyahu and Avi is all, all about? We talk a lot about Eliyahu the prophet. What's his role going to be? He also appears, he arrives. The last prophet, Malachi, speaks about that there's going to be this period of time called Eliyahu and Avi where there will be a tremendous amount of teshuva done. So someone has said that his spirit is already around because we're seeing teshuva being done. But it's not just his spirit. He will really come. His job is Levasera la Geula. We know that he, part of his job will be to announce the redemption is coming, it's imminent. Your last chance to do Teshuvah now. Levasera la Geula, to announce, to give the news all over the world. Mashiach is coming. Your last chance to do Teshuvah. What we see with this, and if you read the prophecy of Malachi, that Hashem intentionally makes it slow and in stages. Also because of that, He wants more and more people to have the chance to do Teshuvah. So Eliyahu Navi somehow facilitates this Teshuvah process through His Spirit, through His presence, through the final announcement, last chance to do Teshuvah. He also, besides announcing the, the Geulah and, and helping do to, uh, everybody do Teshuvah, He will bring about peace in the world. What kind of peace? So in the Mishnah, the last Mishnah in Masechet to Duyot, there is different, different opinions as to what his job is. And some say his job will be to make peace. What kind of peace? Lashvota Machloket. There will be no more Machloket in Am Yisrael between rabbis. We will know what the Halakha is like, whether it was a safek, a doubt we had in the past. He will resolve them. That's also peace, to resolve disputes. And some say, some, in other words, they quote the, the final prophecy that he will restore the hearts of the parents to their kids and the kids to their parents. In other words, that he will bring the families together and facilitate the process of Teshuvah. There is, however, an opinion, a very interesting opinion here, that everybody seems to, to uh, not pay attention to so much. And this is what he says. The first opinion is, that Eliyahu Navi will come l'rachek ha-mekoravim bezroa or l'karev ha-meruchakim bezroa. He will come to distance those who have become Jewish by force and to remove, in other words, to remove those who have become Jewish by force, those who have become close to us by force, and to bring back those who have been removed from Judaism by force. Now, even though not everybody agrees with that, because he, he's not necessarily going to say who is and who is not pure, even though we do have a tradition that the Kohanim and the Levim will need to be known who is pure and who is not for the service in the Bet HaMikdash. Nevertheless, I would like to say that all of these opinions are true, even though each one emphasizes a different job or role of Eliyahu Navi, they're all true, because part of the job of Eliyahu Navi will be to filter out all those who have joined the Jewish nation who don't belong there. There will be a filtering process that will remove the Erev Rav that we've spoken about, those multitudes that don't belong, that are not Jewish in heart. There are many, many Jews who have come from the Soviet Union who are not really Jewish, and everybody's concerned about them. What's going to be? They're not going to mix in. If they do not belong, somehow, through Eliyahu Navi or some other way, they're going to all be removed if, they don't, if they're not really Jewish. And those who have been removed by force, the force of communism, and, other, and all sorts of other powers that have forcefully removed the Jews from their tradition, Eliyahu Navi will bring them back too. He will identify who is a Jew, who is not, and he will bring everybody into the fold. So that will be a very important job of, who? of Eliyahu Navi. And last but not least, we want to know what's going to happen next. So if you want to know what's going to happen next, 
I would ask you to see the lecture that I gave before Pesach, What's Next, Doomsday and Redemption, where I speak more in detail about what's going to happen next. But if you just want to know briefly a little bit of what we're expecting to happen, this is basically what is happening now. We're in the midst, right now, in the midst of the process of milchamot between Yishmael and Edom, fights, battles, wars between Islam and Christianity. That's part of the process, and we're in the midst of it right now. We had some of it before during the Crusades. We've had some a little bit in Spain between the Moors and the Spaniards. And we're having right now one of the last battles between Islam and Christianity, whether it's Al-Qaeda, whether it's terrorism, whether it's in Afghanistan, whether it's in Iraq. And the last part of this confrontation will involve Iran. And when I said this over 30 years ago, people thought, what are you talking about? The Shah is a great man. He's not looking for trouble. He's a good friend of America. And I said, yeah, but we don't know what's going to happen after the Shah. And this is, I'm talking about, this is before the revolution. I pointed to the Midrash that says very clearly that Iran is going to be a troublemaker before, when Mashiach comes. They will have a major role to play. They will be in the newspapers. They will be in the news. And oh, what do you mean, Iran? What does Iran have to do with anything? There were two flights a week, I think, from Tel Aviv to Tehran back then, right? The economy was doing well. People were happy. No trouble. There was always some anti-Semitism here and there. But the big, big description of the end of days that Iran is going to be a headache? Nobody anticipated that until, of course, the revolution. What does Iran have to do with it? That's the question. Iran will be the head of Ishmael because they're Muslim today. And there's still this major confrontation that has to finish up. After this confrontation will come what? Gog Magog, which we'll speak about separately, which will be everybody ganging up on Israel. We're not holding there yet. But that's next. But again, what does Iran have to do with it? Why do they, just because they're Muslims? No. The rabbis tell us in the Gemara, the reason why Iran will play a major role right before Mashiach comes in steering all this trouble is because they helped build the second Beit HaMikdash. The second Beit HaMikdash was assisted by Koresh. He gave the permission. He's the one that let the Jews go back. And therefore, there will be a, a confrontation between who? Between the builders and the destroyers. Who's the destroyers? Rome. Edom. And when the Nekama comes down on the world, when the revenge of Hashem comes down on the world, it comes down on Babylonia, Iraq. Destroyer, destroyers of the first temple comes down on Edom. All over Edom. All over Europe. All over America. It's all part of Edom. It will come down very, very hard for they destroyed the second temple. And of course, Iran is all part of this process too. They have a role to play because of their role in rebuilding the Beit HaMikdash. So if you ever wonder why them, and why they're now thinking of getting all this nuclear technology, satellites, and everything, this is part of the process. So we're, we're, we're still in the midst of that confrontation. But after that will follow the Gog and Magog. After that, of course, will follow a, a process from which the prophets say there is no return. Why is there no return? So the prophet says, You think I will put a woman on her delivery table and she will not deliver? A pregnant woman will not deliver? She goes to the hospital, her water breaks, you think nothing is going to happen? Once the process begins, once it goes through all of this, there's no return. That means we know if this is happening, we know what's going to happen next. So the kibbutz galuyot, with, through, through, which we are experiencing today, is going to happen slowly, but it's going to happen in various ways. One way will be people on their own will move. A second way, people will probably feel pressured to move. A third way may be anti-Semitism in France, in Venezuela. The kibbutz galuyot that we are experiencing now is going to happen in various ways. It doesn't have to happen that Mashiach says, okay, everybody come. He will bring the ones who are left over at the very, very end. But before he arrives, there will already be Kibbutz Galuyot. And the reason, of course, that Kibbutz Galuyot is so important today is not because we're just going back home. It also represents a time, a period of time that HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, I want you to come back to me. <coughs> Kibbutz Galuyot, people have to understand, does not just mean moving to Israel. Kibbutz Galuyot, more importantly, means that Hashem wants the Jewish people, his kids, to go back to him. I'd like to just finish... 
with a, a beautiful chapter. I'm not going to read the whole chapter, but I encourage you to read it. It's uh, one of the last chapters of Yeshayahu, prophet that speaks a lot about the Geula. Beautiful description of the times that we're about to experience after all is said and done, after all the hardships, hardships are over. Just look around. Just look around how all the kids have come home. They will come from all the nations of the world. In other words, the nations will actually assist us in this process of going back to Israel. Who will bring all of these back like a cloud flying in the air, like pigeons going back to the pigeonholes? But that's exactly what will happen. In the end, there will no longer be Hamas in your land. <laughs> Hamas, of course, means thievery, pain, and suffering. Your walls, your cities will be full of salvation, and all the cities in Israel will be full of praise to Hashem. That is the day that we're all looking forward to. Bezat Hashem, it should come very, very soon. Amen.